I should not be alive today. In 1970, rural Canada, two-pound babies did not have a high survival rate. The doctors told my parents I either breathed on my own or I didn't. I breathed. In order to begin my journey, I need to start at the age of 19. My childhood had already passed in a blur of neglect and abuse, significant in a lot of ways, but looking back, not diagnostically. In my freshman year of college, my roommate, Patty, told me I was deaf. I said, what? <laughs> she said, I could not hear the simplest of things, like someone knocking at our dorm room door. That was the beginning of my diagnosis. I got my hearing tested. My hearing loss was significant. Mild in one ear, moderate in the other. The local hospital did an MRI, CT scan, and other tests that I really have forgotten about. They came up with no answers other than I needed hearing aids. I went to my parents to ask them. I found out that not only would they not help me, they had also canceled my health insurance as I was over the age of 18 and on my own. In those days, we did not have computers to verify insurance. So, suddenly, I owed thousands of dollars for the testing that I had, do had done. Because I'd already passed the age of 18, I did not qualify for help either. Financially, hearing aids were an impossibility for me. For the next four years, I advocated for myself as best as I could. I told teachers to speak towards me, repeat questions, and don't cover their faces. I sat at the front. I met with teachers outside of class if I needed additional help. However, depression and fatigue were overtaking my life. I didn't understand what was happening. I just knew I was barely functioning. I often had dizzy spells, overwhelming fatigue, and suicidal thoughts. At the same time, I had debt collectors threatening to sue me if I did not pay my medical bills. With graduation approaching, I had no idea what I would do. I sat outside one of the college buildings with a bottle of Tylenol, trying to convince myself that life would be OK. The next day in 1993, I graduated from the University of St. Catherine with an English writing degree. I got a job at a local pharmacy with health insurance. Almost immediately, I got a physical done. I had not had a menstrual period since I was 15. I was having chest pain, abdominal pain, joint pain. Previously, I was told I might have a brain tumor with the initial round of testing on my hearing. Test results kept coming back negative as though nothing was wrong. Most importantly, I started psychotherapy and got on antidepressants. Through the yellow pages, I found a free, low-cost clinic for hearing aids in Minneapolis. Five years from the initial diagnosis of hearing loss, I finally got my first pair of hearing aids. I could hear. I remember that first time when they turned them on. I asked the audiologist what that noise was. She said, what noise? I listened for a minute, and I realized I could hear the clock ticking. Two years later, in 1995, my journey with Mayo began. I went to bed one night and woke up the next morning and realized I could not hear the toilet flush. My residual hearing was gone. I went to a local ENT doctor who told me, you've had a significant hearing loss. Then he left the room. I sat there in disbelief. Now what? At my mother, mother's friend Sandy's insistence, I called the appointment line at Mayo. In those days, patients saw a primary care physician who farmed out all of the specialty appointments based on his or her exam. I do not remember how many appointments I had. I do remember that I was in Rochester for a week. They studied every part of me. All of the symptoms I had now were present at that time to some degree, all of them. 
At the end of the week, the primary care provider came in the room. He sat down with me and said, I have a psychosomatic disorder with chronic fatigue syndrome caused by childhood abuse. He gave me the name of a psychiatrist in Minneapolis. That was it. I left completely stunned. If my childhood caused this, then how do I treat it? How do I get better? Why do my symptoms feel physical? How did I lose my hearing? I drove to a friend's house in Red Wing on that cold January night. It was one of those nights they didn't advise traveling because of wind chill warnings. I wanted to drive off the road into a field and just go to sleep in the cold. Obviously, I did not. I saw the psychiatrist who told me he could not help me. He didn't know why I was, why I was referred there. That was it. For many years after that, I would sporadically pop up at Mayo for hearing-related issues. None of the other complaints were followed. My husband came into the picture shortly after my initial Mayo trip. We met in 1995 at work, dated in 1996, and were married in 1998. We knew we ha would have difficulty having children. Because of this, we immediately started infertility treatments. Each round brought no answers and no child. As a final ditch effort, the gynecologist did exploratory surgery, and she said she was stumped. There was no reason why we could not have a child. I developed hypertension and diabetes during this time period, but that was blamed on being obese, as was the infertility. Years passed by, and I thought my health was my fault. If only I could lose enough weight, eat right, exercise enough, heal from childhood abuse, and get my brain to stop thinking there was something wrong. If I could just do that, everything would be OK. I was afraid to go to the doctor because everything was in my head. I was a hypochondriac who was just making stuff up. No matter what I did, it was not good enough. So what changed? I had carpal tunnel surgery in 2014. When I saw the surgeon, he looked at the contractures in my wrists and my hands and said, something is not right here. In addition, the preoperative EKG came back as abnormal. I was having short bursts of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Dr. Bacher, my upper extremity surgery, did a total of 13 surgeries in five years. Some minor, some not. During a cubital tunnel release, he saw abnormal fibrous tissue in my biceps. He referred me to rheumatology. The rheumatologist said I need to be seen at Mayo. Something genetic is wrong. He was sure of it. I called Mayo to make an appointment, and I was kindly turned down, saying there was nothing further they could offer me. I don't remember feeling that level of despair many times in my life. I felt like I was speeding towards some unknown fate with no one who could provide me any answers. My life since day one has been about resiliency. Although I had moments where I felt like giving up, I always came back fighting. I cold called the hospital's genetic department. I explained I had a hearing loss. Several doctors were sure was genetically related. The person I spoke with said she happened to know of a doctor who had just moved to Mayo. She would email her and see if she would see me. Dr. Lisa Scamenti entered my life. I came to that first appointment we had with pictures, lists of symptoms, doctor reports, and an attitude. I was not going to take no for an answer. <laughs> I remember her looking me in the eyes and saying, I don't know what's wrong, but we are going to figure this out together. I won't stop until we do. It took four years, but October 2020, I got the phone call. My diagnosis is Myrie syndrome, an ultra-rare genetic connective tissue disorder. In fact, I am the oldest person with it in the United States, and I am the only one with my variation in the world. The ripple effect of getting my diagnosis has been the most amazing thing I have ever experienced. First, I met an entire community of worldwide cousins 
who look like me more so than my biological siblings. I now know people from Scotland, France, Belgium, Australia. I was introduced to the Myrie Syndrome Foundation about three months after diagnosis. Because of my diagnostic journey, they invited me to be on the board. I have been an active board member for about a year and a half. We recently published the first phase of the Myrie Syndrome Patient and Family Handbook, which, was an, which I was an integral part of, as was Dr. Scamenti. In the first 10 days, we have sent out 82 manuals via email around the world to patients and physicians alike. Phase one of the handbook is about defining Myrie, explaining the genetics, and giving patient resources to help them guide them through this difficult diagnosis. The second phase, which will be coming out shortly, gives them specific body areas and how they are affected. Anyone who got the first phase will automatically get the second. We will provide the link for anyone who, who's interested in this. Um, I am making a difference. Plus, I met the second oldest person in the U.S. with Myrie, Holly Dillard Cranfill. She taught me to live life to, to its fullest and have no regrets. Because of her, I got the courage to join the Twin Cities women, Women's Choir. I had no idea if I could match pitch or what I sounded like with my hearing loss. I had not sung in this type of setting for 25 years. They patiently worked with me through my relearning process. At the end of the season last year, I gave a short speech about Myrie syndrome at our concert called Embodiment. I reflected on how one little gene can change everything from my appearance to how I walk to my body shape. I also sang a solo twice last season for the first time in my life. Now, I love my body. I love its uniqueness. I love its challenges. I love the ability to make difference for others. This is all possible because I got a diagnosis. Does it make the challenges of having a rare diagnosis magically disappear? Nope. I still have days where I have three different doctors with three different opinions and no research to back any of them up. No way to determine how to give me the best care. But I have been validated finally. My experience, my truth is real. No one can dismiss that away from me ever again. As a celebration of my truth, I would like to share a video of the Twin Cities Women's Choir group, Encore, singing a song by Poppy Rose called I Love My Body. It never fails to move me to tears. It, for anyone who is interested, the next concert is December 3rd, and it's called Circle Game. Thank you for listening. Enjoy. Enjoy. 